Hello, everybody, and welcome to our James Beard Foundation webinar, Chefs for School Food, Combating Hunger During COVID-19. My name is Ashley Koziak, and I'm with the James Beard Foundation, and I'm just here to do a brief welcome and, you know, go over some of our regular webinar information before handing it over to this really amazing panel that we have lined up today. So how the webinar works, if you are joining us for the first time, this might be new, if you've been to our webinars before, this is all very, very familiar. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded. Uh, by next week, the recording will be available on the past webinars and events page at openforgood.com. Uh, so you, you'll be able to view this as well as all of our previous webinars on that page. You'll also be able to sign up for our upcoming webinars We've got a lot of webinars happening in April. Uh, we got webinars for Earth Day. We've got all sorts of stuff happening. So I do recommend you check out our upcoming webinars page. It is a full slate this month. So go ahead and check that out as well as visit there if you want the recording of this webinar. We'll field questions as time allows. We'll usually get to questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the program. In order to submit a question, that's done via kind of the, the text messaging um, thing within GoToWebinar. There's a little uh, message thing that with a little question mark icon in it. That's how you submit your questions. Go ahead and submit your questions that way. You can submit them at any time over the course of the webinar. But like I said, we will field most of the questions at the close of the program. Finally, if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, let us know, message us using the webinar toolbar. We'll do what we can to troubleshoot. Uh, unfortunately, we it's its my colleague Megan and I, uh, and we do not have GoToWebinar staff on call, but we will do our best to help you as we can. Sometimes the best solution is to log off and log back on. Oftentimes, if you're having any audio issues, that helps. Uh, so now we're going to get right into the webinar. Like I said, we have a great panel today, and I am really excited to introduce the panel moderator, Maya Feller. Uh, Maya Feller, MS, RD, CDS, Brooklyn-based Maya Feller Nutrition is a registered dietitian nutritionist who is a nationally recognized nutrition expert. Maya received her Master's of Science in Clinical Nutrition at New York University, where she is adjunct uh, faculty. Whether addressing the nation or working one-on-one -on -one with groups, my belief in providing nutrition education from an anti-bias, patient-centered, culturally sensitive approach. Maya is dedicated to promoting nutrition education that helps the public to make informed food choices that support health and longevity. Maya, thank you so much for being here today and moderating this panel. Ashley, thank you so much for having me and thank you to the James Beard Foundation for putting on this excellent panel. Uh, so before we dive into Chefs for School Food, Combating Hunger During COVID-19, I would like to introduce you all to the extraordinary panelists that we will hear from today and that we'll be in conversation with. Julia McCarthy is the Deputy Director of the Lori M. Tisch Center for Food Education and Policy at Teachers College, Columbia University. She was previously a senior policy associate at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, where she oversaw the organization's healthy retail and food marketing to kids initiatives. McCarthy has worked at the Natural Resource Defense Council and the Food and Drug Administration. She has a BA in history from Georgetown University and a JD from New York University Law School, where she was the Ruth Tilden Kern Scholar. Hi, Julia. And now we have James. Chef James Martin has worked with Chef R.J. Cooper at Vidalia, Chef Bruce Sherman at North Pond in Chicago, Chef Michael Minna at the Bourbon Steak, and three Michelin star Chef Jean Georges in New York City. He has headed his own pop-up district supper, which ran at Prequel and Dinner Lab, and kitchens at Restaurant Nora, America's first all-organic restaurant, in Pamplonia, Virginia, and Bistro B, landing the restaurant back on Washingtonian's top 100 restaurants after a two-year hiatus. Well done, James. Chicago's A10 and Bang Bang Pie and Biscuits. Today, he is venturing out with his wife to open his first restaurant concept, Bocadillo Market. I have some patients in Chicago who I will be sending to Bocadillo Market. James, get ready. And next, we have Andrea. 
Andrea is the chef and owner at Lantern, where she collaborates with small farms and producers across North Carolina and is an advocate for food policy change. Rusing was the recipient of the James Beard Award for the Best Chef Southeast in 2011. And Lantern was named one of Gourmet's Magazines America top 50 restaurants and one of America's 50 most amazing wine experiences in food and wine. Rusing is the founder of Kitchen Patrol, Lantern's project to improve children's access to quality food through weekly cooking classes and serves on the board of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Andrea, welcome and thank you for joining us. And last but certainly not least, we have Bill Telpan. Bill Telpan is the new culinary director at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Before joining Bon Appetit Management Company, the Met's new food service provider, this leader in green market cooking, was most recently executive chef at Oceana. His beloved Upper West Side restaurant, Telpan, earned him a Michelin star, a glowing two-star review from the New York Times, and the title of best newcomer in the Zagat survey. Bill serves as executive chef to Wellness in the Schools, WITS, a nonprofit group dedicated to improving children's health by enriching lunch and recess programs at public schools, and leads WITS Cooking for Kids program. He is also the first ever Director of Sustainability at the ICE, that's the Institute of Culinary Education, developing a sustainably focused curriculum that includes teaching students how to grow and harvest food in ICE's hydroponic garden. So we have this incredible lineup of panelists. And I wanna kind of, you know, dive in and really set this stage for us, right? So since COVID-19 has hit, chefs have faced countless troubles of their own. You know, but still, given kind of this time that we're in, they have been incredibly generous, especially when it comes to combating childhood hunger. You know, there's this statistic that's out that says, you know, one in every four children will experience hunger as a result directly of COVID-19. So we know that this is an extraordinary moment. We also know that chefs have been integral partners with schools, working closely to ensure that families have access to healthy foods. Some have used their star power to draw attention to the issue of rising rates of food insecurity, and others have continued cooking fresh, delicious meals for students despite these closures, and others are also helping to support school food staff. So let's jump into this first question. We know that many schools are closed, so why are we not even talking about school meals during this time? Julia? Maya, it's a great question. Um, I think the, the sort of most important point here is that school meals are a lifeline for many American families. 30 million um, American students rely on school breakfasts and school lunches every single day, meaning that half of all school-aged children um, have been at risk of going hungry since March of last year when schools shuttered. And you know we know rates um, of food insecurity are sky high, but they're especially high for Black and Latinx families. Um, and these are the very same families that have borne the brunt of COVID-19. Um, and, and, and this is a really important point because cafeteria doors closing didn't just increase student likelihood of hunger, it also just made healthy eating a whole lot harder. Um, so, you know, for many low-income students, the food they eat in their classrooms and in their cafeterias, it's healthier than the food they get at home. And this is for a host of reasons. You know, on one hand, it's as we have really strong federal nutrition standards um, that ensure that students get a variety of fruits and vegetables at every meal. And the other is that many communities, um, there's been a disinvestment in you know, healthy food environments. And so you know, families don't have access to the supermarket in their neighborhood that has you know, pyramids of apples or a fresh cut fruit medley glistening in the fridge. Um, and I think that you know, as we talk about school food, right now, um, it's really important to recognize that it looks very different than it normally does. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is the federal agency that oversees the school meal program, has made it a lot easier um, for schools to, to continue serving, knowing that people rely on these meals. Um, and so there's currently 
um, a national temporary uh, universal free school meal program. So anyone can go and get a free meal. And this is a huge, um, important development at this time. Um, schools can also distribute meals that are grab and go. So parents can go pick up for their kids. That's a really big change too, to the school meal program. Um, and two other sort of important changes to, to how school meals look right now um, are bulk foods and PEBT. So, um, you know, rather than sort of individually wrapped breakfasts and lunches right now, districts can actually pool their resources to serve the bulk foods. So there's gallons of milk, bags of rice, bushels of lettuce. Um, but these are foods that maybe, you know, families get in bulk and need to figure out what to do with. And finally, um, the federal government has allowed families to access a new benefit that looks a lot like food stamps called Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer, or PEBT. And that program um, gives each family $5.70 for each student for every day that school is closed. And so families have more buying power, which you know is so important when we know people are losing jobs out of work um, or don't want to travel every day to school to have a grab and go. That's incredible. So Julia, you know, you mentioned this program where families now have access to these buying dollars. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that specifically, especially because school foods have been lost, right? So what are they able to purchase with those buying dollars? Are there restrictions or anything specific that we should know? Um, well, I think a, one really important about these buying dollars is that, you know, for every dollar that's spent on them, they generate another dollar and 50 cents in local economic activity. So when we're, you know, worried about our economy coming back, when we're worried about um, how hard, you know, communities of color and low income communities have been hit, um, spending this money is, you know, really good for the local economy and is one of the best ways to sort of get us back on our feet. Um, you can purchase, you know, basically any food that would be available on food stamps with this money. And um, that means that, you know, it's, it does not typically include like hot prepared foods in a supermarket, but pretty much any other food in a supermarket. Um, yeah. So we, we love this benefit um, from a policy perspective because it allows families to buy the foods that they like at a time that's convenient for them and to prepare, prepare them in ways that they want. And so, um, you know, it's much more likely that a family is, is getting culturally relevant foods when they're purchasing themselves than instead of going and picking up grab and go meals. So I will say, you know, being based in New York City, um, our school district has done a phenomenal job in tr trying to provide culturally relevant meals, kosher, halal, vegetarian, et cetera. It's excellent. Um, so Andrea, I know in your work, you've been, you know, helping to provide access to weekly cooking classes. So kind of from the lens of what Julie has just shared, you know, what are you seeing in your area specifically? Well, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, most every restaurant closed within a couple of days and then we were forced to close. So I think what we had was, you know, school districts that were shut down with um, with thousands and thousands of kids with no access to the normal meals that they were eating. And we also had restaurant workers, many of whom um, were not eligible for unemployment benefits, uh, who really needed to work and needed to cook. And then we also had, you know, the, the lots of lots of food workers and cooks and chefs and cafeterias who also were in the position of, you know, their hours being decreased and potential layoffs because a lot of the schools just pivoted to um, kind of like commodity prepackaged foods because you know there was a huge emergency and that was just kind of a very safe kind of change to make very quickly to kind of like rapidly feed many many people so i found myself um in an opportunity to partner with a number of different groups it was like durham public schools their foundation food insight group um and really the the nutrition director in durham is this wonderful man named um jim keaton and it was a very like open very cool partnership where we had a very short period of time to pull together um, really great meals from about 28 restaurants and food businesses 
Um, you know, at its peak, that program um, called Durham Feast, we were doing about 75,000 meals a week uh, from an, just a number of different restaurants. And so I think the opportunity there was to give the staff like a little support in terms of these meals. We captured all the recipes um, as part of this partnership. They're all available. They're all, um, they meet the USDA requirements, maybe with some waivers and some changes they would in the normal year. But I mean, I think that was this very, very important um, lifeline to a lot of restaurant workers. And it was also, we were making this great food um, and, you know, folks were pretty happy with it. And there was a large variety of meals because we were working with so many different um, outlets for that. That project morphed into Eat and See, which is a project that's now in three different districts and we're doing ingredient boxes I think folks were getting sick of people cooking their <laughs> their food. They wanted to cook themselves. Um, and so we're able to partner with a bunch of people that we're getting local produce from and local cheese and um, eggs. And then we have like lots of produce and fruit. And then we combine it with some pantry items with some like flavor boosters, maybe like a, a dried herb kit for beans or a salad dressing or some sauces. And we have like a package basically that's being home delivered and it has about six or seven different recipes in it for all different meals that kind of utilize those ingredients in different ways with leftovers and things like that. Um, and then the other project that we're working on, you know, we're developing products for schools because the really important thing is to get these folks back to work um, in their normal jobs and actually um, use COVID to kind of help advocate for not just you know, in improvements in wages in restaurants, but also in these institutional food settings, regardless of where they are, hospitals, cafeterias, um, and schools, you know, these folks are like some of the lowest paid people in the country. Many of them make $12 an hour, $12,000 a year, have very limited hours. And I think as kind of rest the restaurant community aligning itself with the food worker community in schools, we can really make some very positive change. There's a lot of commodity meat that's just building up because it's not being eaten. It's just building up in these freezers all over the country, really. And so, you know, we're working on some products where we take local vegetables and create a stew that like the cafeteria people can actually use these pre-made sauces and vegetables to, to combine with that commodity meat because there's not a lot of cooking being done in many cafeterias. So that's kind of another another kind of future vision of how restaurants and schools can work together. Um, yeah. That's pretty incredible from the nutrition perspective, you know, as a dietitian, that's what we want to hear, right? We want to hear that there's this push for, you know, honoring food ways and then the push for increasing healthy options for consumption because really we always talk about you know the pediatric population as being the groundwork for future eating habits and also like a reflection of the health of the nation in a generation to come so that's really incredible you know so this leads me to the next kind of question that i want to think about a little bit like you know, schools are a place where we encourage healthy eating, right? And the meals not only combat food insecurity, but they create a food culture that really exposes kids to this wide variety of fruits and vegetables. I know from some of my work in New York that when children went to school, that was, you know, depending on the district that they were in, that was sometimes the sole exposure to a fruit or a vegetable. But with many food schools closed, students are really, they're losing touch with these healthy patterns and also the patterns that school meals reinforce. So we know that chefs have played this incredible part in encouraging kids to eat healthfully during this time. And so, you know, James, I'd love to hear from you and Bill about what some examples of this really look like in the real world. Um, yeah, so th th this last year, um, I got a chance to partner with uh, Pilot Light, um, who was started, one of the founding chefs, is one of my chefs that I worked for here in Chicago. Um, four chefs started in 2010, Chef Paul Cahan, Chef uh, Jason Hamill, Chef Justin Large, and Chef Matthias Merges started this based on Michelle Obama's um, Let's Move campaign. Um, based on connecting teachers and their organization, uh, based on lessons based on food, um, but built on uh, academics. That's like whether, whether they're learning science, math, social studies, history, wellness, uh, physical education, 
they, and then they, they, they partner with a chef normally or a professional in the food world and they kind of bring that lesson to the, to the, to the um, students uh, with the collaboration with the chef and the teacher. Um, and I had the chance to partner with a teacher named Paul Floyd at Evergreen Elementary High School, I mean, elementary, elementary school. Um, and we did it all virtually because of the COVID. Um, so a lot of things have changed. Um, Sometimes I think they've done things in person, um, but things have now um, been now obviously virtual. That's why we're on this webinar, um, but it allowed uh, kids to still be connected to their teacher um, and also learn more about food education, food history, and just really connect the academic sides because you know food is science, food is math, food is history, food is you know all these different things. Um, and when we did this class, we we did a a, a class and a lesson based on apples, um, textures, history, colors, um, where they come from, what season they grow in, seasonality. So I think um, Palo Light really brought this uh, this really amazing program to Chicago, and they're actually growing outside of Chicago as well. In other states, I think New York, LA, and California, California, um, and they're trying to branch out and really make this connection with the teacher and ask ask the teacher what are what are the students learning at the moment, um, and then connect that with food education um, based on their curriculum. Um, and I've been really excited to be a part of this organization and this opportunity to really teach kids about food um, and also really the health benefits of eating food and and your physical elements too when you're whether you're you know, in school, whether you're elementary or middle or high, you're, you're working out, you're playing football, you're playing sports. So food is really important to your physical, your phys you know, your physical body. So um, I think just really connecting students where, where, where they can learn about how food is cooked, but also how it affects their body, their brain, their heart, and it really makes them become stronger and smarter people um, through learning more about food and exposure as well. Because um, we're also not able to travel as much. So sometimes when you're able to educate these kids about food and new ingredients, and their world opens up a lot larger. You know. James, um, I have to ask you, is there anything that kind of stood out in your interactions with those kids? You know, when you went in there and you were doing this education and kind of doing the texture and temperature and color, like, did anyone say anything that just made you go like, yeah, that's right? Yeah, I, I think the cool thing is just teaching kids about like seasonality and trying to get them to understand that food is growing at a certain point of time. And I think just their excitement, their energy um, behind learning about, especially when they like something, you know, we're talking about apples, so high in sugar content. So, and, uh, but to kind of teach them about how apples make so many different things, applesauce, apple butter, you know, different jams and also using naturally a apples produce pectin which is a thickening agent and actually teaching them and they were just like whoa what is you know what is pectin so i think just their excitement behind the food education but also just that connection with the teacher you know you when you have a passionate teacher when you have somebody that really connects with their staff and then you then they bring on a partner like myself and that that works really well i think they're just excited about learning about new foods and and how to prepare them especially in this time being home more with your family that's an excellent point. Um, I know I jumped in. Uh, I just had to ask James that question. So, Bill, in your you know experience with Wits, um, what's the pivot been right now during COVID, especially kind of you know trying to manage healthy foods in the schools right now and thinking about that. Well, we we would uh, in a normal year we would bring culinary school graduates uh, or cooks uh, to work alongside the cafeteria workers to sort of help them do you know less processed food, um, uh, scratch cooking, um, and then they would also do cooking classes. And so once we once COVID hit and schools closed down, uh, our pivot was to sort of do you know work more with uh, virtual lessons. So to continue these lessons that we we would go into a classroom four times a year, uh, we would we would we would uh, we would teach every kid in the school uh, over a course of a week. We would basically we call them Wits Labs because we would take over the science lab week um, in the school, and uh, we would go in and they would all get like these little plastic knives, and we would teach things like vegetarian chili or making hummus or roasting potatoes. Um, and so we would have to, we, how we pivoted was we would just bring these lessons to um, the classrooms uh, virtually. And so some, they, would get their, they would get their recipes sent to them and, 
and hopefully they would have uh, with their parents uh, some of the um, ingredients they would need to cook with. Um, and and then we would just continue that way. And I think um, we also, um, we do these things called WITS bits, which were like little exercise bits or nutritional bits. And we continue to do them virtually, which has uh, been awesome to sort of, it just keeps that sort of, you know, the, the point of it is to sort of bring food and healthy food uh, or thoughts into the classroom and, and, and into the curriculum and uh, be, to be able to continue that has been really wonderful. Um, and we've also, um, in, in terms of our, um, you know, cooking alongside in, in the cafeteria, we obviously were not allowed in yet. Uh, so what we have been doing, uh, we have been teaching these throughout before COVID, we would do these cook camps where we would bring in 20 to 30 uh, cooks from New York City who work alongside of our staff and actually do a three day like boot camp with them. Um, and, and it would not just be about the actual cooking, but we would talk about the why of it. Like, why do we want to feed these kids and ourselves healthy food? You know, talk about fighting obesity. We would have people share stories, have the cooks share stories about themselves and, and health and, and issues in their family. Um, and it's been really wonderful to see. That, I mean, that's been great because you can really connect to it. And I would ask some of my chef friends to come in to provide a healthy breakfast and um, and to talk about uh, health and food themselves. And um, but now where that's also been done virtually, but that's been really wonderful because we've been able to sort of actually do more uh, people. We've been able to virtually uh, work with uh, you know up to 60 to 70 people at a time. So that's been uh, uh, really wonderful. Um, our cooks have been really um, amazing because they not only have uh, continued this stuff in the school, but they've branched outside the schools. They, they partnered with community centers who would go and pick up meals and they would do cooking lessons with them. If there was baskets of food they would be picking up, they would talk about what, they're, what, they're, what they have in the basket, how they can cook with them. Um, they've also launched somewhat of a TV series uh, on, and uh, it's called um, uh, A Bite of Wellness on BronxNet. Uh, so for people who don't have access to Wi-Fi or computers, they can still uh, see or they can still have these lessons that we teach in the school and, and are, um, are, you know, they have access to it. Um, and then to continue that, we've also been working with um, Feed the Front Lines, which is a community-based organization that in the beginning was getting food to first responders, but now they're um, working with uh, um, people in need and um, also with college students who are in college, but you know don't have access to healthy food and bringing healthy food to them there. And then one last thing is that these community fridges have been popping up all along New York City, and I think it may be across the country, but uh, a couple of our, our our chefs have been working in these community, you know, connecting, um, you know, healthy food um, to bring to these community fridges. And in fact, um, we have at the Met have been doing meals regularly to to these fridges. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> that's inc that's incredible. And so, Bill, I have to say, you know, in the neighborhood that I live and work in, which is Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. I've walked around and I've seen a number of these community fridges. And for people who don't know what that is, it's a refrigerator that's been placed by an organization. And then it's fully stocked with uh, food. It can have, and the freezer is full and the refrigerator portion is full. And it's there for anyone who needs it to actually go and access food. Um, and so I've seen them and I think it's a wonderful initiative. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned kind of also the staff in the schools, and Andrea, you talked about the staff as well. You know, so we know that encouraging children to eat healthfully is one portion of the puzzle. The other part is the staff, right, the people that work there. And sometimes those food, school food staff, you know, they, they're overlooked, and they've really been working around the clock this year. And there are many organizations that both you, Andrea, talked about, and you, Bill, also um, have you know, stepped in to support their work, and you as well, James. So um, could you all share some examples of what those partnerships have looked like and how your organizations are specifically supporting school food staff? I guess I'll go. I mean, like I said, we were we're going we're we're bringing our what we call cook camps to the, to them, um, and what what I think is most important to them, like you said, is is they're working around the clock, and I think they're working really hard. But you know, to sort of encourage them to 
sort of continue to, you know, like it may be like a really difficult time in, in, in all of our lives and especially them when they're working really hard, they may just want to be just like, you know, we just want to get food out, but to sort of really make them think about like, you know, the why again, the why are we doing this? Why do we want to get these kids healthy meals? Um, and how important it is for them at this point when, you know, one of the things that you we've learned a lot uh, through this whole COVID-ness uh, is that, you know, it's if you are unhealthy, actually, it's, it, you know, the, the ramifications are worse for you. So to continue to eat well, stay healthy, um, has been, and somebody I talked to also was saying that exercise, just keep exercise is so important during this time. Um, and um, I think giving them that support um, and hearing them and talk to them about how we, they can take care of themselves is a, a big point of what we do with these cook camps and um, and encourage them and to you know feed the, themselves and their families well. Absolutely, absolutely. Andrea, did you have anything that you know you wanted to share? And I really appreciate what you said, Bill. That you know one of the things that we've learned in COVID is that individual health that of the students and that of the people that are serving the students actually all of us really is incredibly important when we're looking at outcomes just around you know disease in general um so that's a really valid point and something that i think you know has been a huge learning for all of us in this moment especially knowing that we are in a nation that's in a healthcare crisis um otherwise we wouldn't even be having this conversation right um, so Andrea, I know that you mentioned some of the work that you were doing specifically, you know, with the classes, but, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, the people who are running the classes and how kind of what that looks like for them as well. Yeah, well, so we do classes. We had a program that was in person that, um, we had about 12 to 15 fourth and fifth graders come every week, uh, the whole year. And it was a two year program. And COVID, similarly to, to Bill, and James, I'm sure to you, it's like we're able to reach so many more people. It's incredible, and I don't think we plan on going back. You know, um, we're doing it on Zoom, and we're, we have a great grant, generous grant from No Kid Hungry, and we're delivering with volunteers, like a network of volunteers, we're delivering 40 entire meal kits to families, and then they join us with a guest chef, um, usually someone from the community, someone from a restaurant, people kids know. Um, to, to kind of make a meal together, and then we um, then we all sit down and eat separately, but we say cheers before we sign off. But to the kind of to the point of folks who work in food service and cafeterias, I think it's been a real two way street. Chefs have learned so much from um, from the school food workforce. We wouldn't know how to design a menu that would get USDA reimbursement without so many registered dietitians helping us. Um, the, the folks I'm specifically thinking of are from Food Insight Group in Durham, um, Lyndon Thayer and Beth Katz. They've done a ton, but also really just trying to be a chef and going into a cafeteria is just a really eye-opening, a restaurant chef going into a cafeteria is an eye-opening experience and one that if you're not prepared, it can be very um, challenging because just the volume, the sheer volume is incredible. And what these folks do every day is, is heroic. Um, so what we've tried to do is just share recipes, like all the restaurants share recipes back and forth with any school that's interested in them. We also have been developing products that these folks want. So somebody may want this specific kind of salad dressing and they can't find it, um, or they wanna use buttermilk, local buttermilk for a specific dressing. So we're helping them source, we're just acting as a resource generally. Um, and then I think just from a structural point of view, the reason that these wages are so low is because it is a part of the plan of the school food system. The school food system is um, designed to serve a community, our community, our children, um, our nieces and nephews, our grandchildren, and it's not serving those folks as well as it could be. It's serving corporations, it's serving a hierarchical extractive food structure um, and economy. And I think like to just say that these, these positions are low skill, low wage, they're low skill by design because they want as much processed food pumping through the system as possible. So I think it's really important to think about scratch cooking. It goes along with better wages, a career path and actual training. And I think that that's something that restaurant folks can start to help advocate for. That's incredible, Andrea. You know, at the beginning, Julia mentioned 
this kind of push and importance around honoring uh, my race, right? Um, so uh, I know we're getting to, to Sorry, the end. Sorry, I was just going to react to Andrea. I think oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Julia. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, I think that a, a real key here is recognizing the power in school food staff. So both at the, the micro and the macro level, um, you know, in, in schools, I was a former second grade teacher and you become sort of like mom and the school food workers often are like the cool aunt that, that you know, students can talk to and work through problems. And I think that they have incredible influence because they're often hired from the community too and, you know, look like the student population. and so. I think that you know both um, anything that we can do to sort of lift up the dignity of, of that role is really important because they're key players in in, in any school. Um, that's one sort of important point there that I think Andrea was making, and I just wanted to emphasize again. Um, but another point would be that you know the school food staff are really the best advocates. On the on the hill, like in federal government on school food, like they, um, in terms of pushing for more access, and so you know we have been working closely with the School Nutrition Association to try and um, expand free school meals for all. And I think that um, you know there's power in numbers and 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 really recognizing like the work that they do at the federal level is important too, right? Um, so saying like you know just making clear that. Um, this is, you know, all the work that they've been doing this year, it's been horrendous, like with the stress, but, you know, we, we all really feel um, incredibly sort of grateful for that work, both at the local level and the federal level. Absolutely. So, Julia, you started out by uh, uh, piggybacking on something that Andrea said, and I was going to ask you, and I wanted to open this up to the group before we get into our last set of questions and then take questions from the audience. Um, you mentioned the importance of cultural foods, right? And having students in communities, especially Black, Brown, Latinx, uh, Indigenous, Asian American communities, seeing people like them prepare the foods, eating foods that are familiar and not having their foods demonized, right? So, because that's kind of what happens in mainstream food culture is that there's one way to eat and then everyone else has to fall in line. But you mentioned the importance, Julia, of really honoring these food ways. And Andrea, you talked about, right, giving people what they want. And so I wanted to open it up to kind of hear from you, Julia, how you all have really been honoring food ways and culture. And then also from everyone else, like how do you really incorporate what the community wants while still thinking about keeping health at the forefront? And I know that that's a huge question. <laughs> I mean, what, one thing that our coalition has done, so we, you know, we run this food ed coalition in New York City that has um, 80, around 80 organizations that work in schools on food education. Um, we have, you know, pushed for kosher meals, um, for halal meals in New York City. Um, we have asked for vegetarian meals, but I think also we've pushed for an expansion of scratch cooking. So we've asked for that in school meals going forward. Um, I think that right right now, one of the most important pieces of work we're doing, we're, we're a research center, um, is actually asking the families what they would like to see in school food. So, um, you know, in, in this moment, we know that there are a lot of voices that often aren't heard and people are doing research asking you know school food what kind of job they think they're doing and we're like well why has no one asked families what they want and how they're experiencing the food right now so um we have staff who are doing focus groups with families to really figure out like how we can continue to improve um and i'll give a shout out to our partners at berkeley and stanford because they did this research first and we're using their methods so I want to be clear that you know it's a partnership. Thanks. Uh, anybody else want to add in or um, share kind of what's happening, what you're thinking in this area before we move into the last question and then open for questions from the audience? Well, I think you made a good point about how you, you the community and the and the people working in the communities, um, like you know, 
some communities might not want red beans, they want black beans and vice versa. And I think um, you, you know, talking to the, the school food worker who does generally come from that community is definitely uh, a plus uh, in sort of what, you know, what to serve. But I also like the idea of, you know, exposing kids to different cultures through food. And I think um, one of the ways we can do that is, is you know, creating different menus that we're creating special days um, that uh, would expose kids to this. And, and that's also becomes an educational piece too that you can, you know, tie into school lessons somehow. Absolutely. And James, I know you talked about that as well, right? Like bringing in these ideas. So I'm going to hand it over to you, let you jump in. <laughs> yeah, pick, picking back off of Bill, you know, I think that I was that was right on top of my head, like food education, you know, and, and you know, even when we're the apple lesson, like we, we introduced that, you know, pancakes go really well, with, you know, apples and all these different other elements go well with apples. And I think just educating the, the students about how you know, everyone don't eat the same, you know, and then even some of the students that I actually taught and with all um, English was actually their second language, you know, so sometimes and these schools are a lot more diverse than we think in America. And I think we also got to understand those things, too. Um, and sometimes when they're coming to school, they're eating different things and when they're going home, they're eating different things. So making sure that we're just balancing that educational piece. Um, and just diversifying those ingredients and, and, and teaching people about there are non perishable items like I, I taught the students about, you know, if you're, if you're dairy free, if you're allergic to dairy or, you know, um, you can do almond milk. If you're if you're nut free, you can do banana milk or coconut milk, you know, all these different things that are accessible now that are not have to be refrigerated. Um, this is so much new food. It's a food wave of technology and information that we can use to really provide really healthy food for students, but also be diverse. Um, you know, whether that's Asian flavors, Spanish flavors, Italian flavors, American flavors. We don't have to have pizza every day or every week. I think just kind of changing that that mindset. Um, and knowing that even like when you think about Asian food, um, rice noodles are an example for itself. You know, rice noodles are so, so reasonable in price, you know, and they can feed the masses. <laughs> once you once you once you bloom them with some some beautiful water, you know, you can feed the masses with those. So I think Sometimes we think, you know, fresh food or delicious food is expensive. And I think, and also, or a lot of times I've also been explained, one of my, uh, I met a, a broker that went to school that's from Argentina. And when he went to school while other kids were eating PB and J, he came to school with seafood salad and all the kids said, ill, you know, and then when you get older, they realize like, wow, he was eating seafood salad while we were eating PB and J. And, <laughs> He was happy with a seafood salad, you know, but a lot of kids would, were not introduced to those things. Um, and so the first thing they're saying, ill, we're not used to that. So I think we just got to kind of change that mindset with the students. And I think Pilot Light does a really good job with that. Um, and that's why I'm proud to be a part of their, their partnership with them and, and being a part of that, like those teaching lessons. But also we, um, Pilot Light also allowed us to bring the ingredients to the students as well when we did these lessons. Um, we put the, li the list together and we gave it to Paul and they, we, we made access for them to actually get the ingredients while we're actually doing the lesson. So all these different things play in a part with making sure the kids are growing and changing and, and opening their mindsets when it comes to having different ingredients um, at their lunch table. That's so, that's so cool what you're doing. That's awesome. I mean, I think asking the kids to me is like a revelation because we've learned so much and I'm a mom of two kids that I, I you know, I love, but I don't often ask them what they want for dinner because that's just opening a can of worms. But we um, just have been doing surveys like every couple weeks and it's so fun to read them. I would encourage everyone chefs doing this kind of work, do the surveys because they're just, you learn so much and you learn uh, it's not like Yelp at all. It's not like reading Yelp reviews. It's just like, it's very, very, um, it's really engaging and it's really cool. And we've been bringing in a lot of guests. Um, there's a couple kids that wanted to make Puerto Rican food this year. So Von Diaz is coming in and we can pull online, we can pull people from um, all over the place. So that's been really special. Um, but it is hysterical because we did a survey of what you want to cook this year with, with the families and mostly the kids. And we, you know, we even like sent cupcakes to people who fill out surveys and things like that. But um, the kids were just like, number one was California rolls. So 
you know, I found myself having to teach kids how to make California rolls, and that was really funny. So it's like the answers surprise you sometimes, really. Andrea, that's incredible and so awesome. And I have to say from the nutrition lens, if all dietitians would actually survey people about what they eat, what they want, and what they're interested in, I wonder where we'd be in 15 years from now. <laughs> incredible, simply incredible. Um, so, you know, you all touched on kind of surveying families and kids and, and thinking about where we are now, but if there are chefs that want to get involved in school meals and supporting kind of these efforts, what would be the, you know, recommendation, advice, resources that all of you would put forth for them? Julia, do you want to get started? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so, I mean, two things. One, you can follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter is below my bio there, and we'll be sharing opportunities this year related to child nutrition reauthorization. So that's a federal bill that happens, should happen every couple years. Um, hasn't happened during the last administration, but will basically provide additional funding and updates to all the programs that feed kids. Um, and we will be doing a huge push along with partners to make uh, healthy school meals available to all students for free going forward. So, um, you know, if you can lend your voice to that, that's really important. I, I have to say, like, having James, Andrea, and Bill talk about school food is so exciting because, like Andrea said, it's, it's often not a sexy topic. It's, it's institutional. And so you all bring this sort of um, gravitas or, or sex appeal to an issue that often doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, and secondly, you know, do what these chefs have done, get involved with a food ed organization. So, you know, in, in New York City, we run the Food Ed Coalition. There are 80 groups and they'd love to partner with chefs. Um, but if you're elsewhere in the country, I'm sure there are local groups just like this that um, you can, you know, lend time or money to um, to also help. Fantastic, thank you. Um, what's What's not sexy about a hairnet and a plastic apron? Uh, you know, I can't think of anything sexier, people. Um, On you, Bill. <laughs> Bill, you so, wear it well. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I um, I'm, I um, I want to just say that uh, one of the things we uh, are talking about at uh, Wellness in the Schools is is sort of revitalizing the chef's move to schools. I think it's a very important time now, uh, more than ever, even though we're they're not in the schools to, you know, get help chef gets involved, chefs get involved to talk about um, eating well um, and cooking again. I think that's, and Maya, you could probably uh, agree with this, is that, you know, just cooking your own food, um, uh, um, you know, making something that uh, your children like, that is generally processed, but uh, to, you know, um, but to create these uh, meals from scratch at home is very important. And I think chefs, um, while it is daunting going into a school cafeteria, I think it's also a um, wonderful thing to uh, be able to sort of help, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the community to sort of cook again. And I think, you know, that's what we're, so um, we're thinking about uh, talking to some people um, about getting this on. I think with the new administration and with the CNR being revisited, it's a great time uh, for us to sort of uh, get chefs involved. Um, considering that, you know, a lot of the stuff we've done in the past with Chef Move, and, uh, with Tish Center, with, with No Kid Hungry at Lobbying, I think chefs are an important voice in, in this. Um, and, you know, with, uh, you know, that the Chef's Move was launched by the Obama administration, and with their connection, with their ties to the Biden, uh, the Bidens, I think it's a, a, a it's a right time. It is a hopeful time, right? And I agree 100% from the nutrition lens. You know, this idea of scratch cooking, or really this kind of ethos of scratch cooking in both the home and at school, is incredibly important. Um, Andrea, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I think. Well, first of all, I would encourage restaurant chefs to reach out to me on Twitter or Instagram or my email. Um, and just, if you want to get involved in your community and do some of this cooking, you know, there's actually like an opportunity to break even and even do a little bit better and have folks working before 
you reopen over the summer. There's a massive need um, for summer feeding programs, and the, the regulations are a little bit looser in the summer. Um, I think working with a dietitian who understands the regulations is great, um, and and there's there's national organizations that can help you. I could put you in touch with. Um, but the other thing is you can go on the USDA website, and there's a treasure trove of recipes, and they have like the the right amount of protein, the right amount of vegetable, the right amount of whole grain, and you can adapt those recipes to local ingredients very easily. And that's a really kind of quick way to just um to just figure out how you can make something meet the regulations excellent excellent so james i have a question for you so i'm gonna combine the question with your answer and the question is could you share the website or social media or more information on pilot light education program that you talked about um so pilot light um is is this organization that's based out of chicago um, just like I said, they're definitely growing with other partners outside of Chicago. Um, they like to collaborate with the teacher and the professional, whether it's a chef or someone in the food industry or even someone that just loves food or teaching about food and connecting that with the academics, whether it's history, math, science, um, math, science, social studies, wellness, physical education. Um, but you can follow Pilot Light on their Instagram at Pilot Light. Um, and so that's easy accessibility for chefs to connect with them. Um, I, I really appreciate being a part of this because I connect I connect with them to the community, with the kids, and it just really allows me to be more connected with the city of Chicago and the community, um, and then just growing my family as well through Pilot Light. Um, but, um, and then so from there, you can connect with Pilot Light and you can kind of email them or, or reach out to them through social media. And then, and you can also ask for what kind of opportunities that they have open, whether it's teaching the students, whether it's uh, creating um, kind of lessons for the, for for the students to learn, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a chef. Um, but it's a lot of opportunity for collaboration with Pilot Light, I would say. Excellent. And now this next question is for everyone. Uh, with any of these programs, are there opportunities for students to volunteer and get involved? Andrea, did you want to get started? Um, I'm assuming that the question refers to students um, in schools or maybe culinary students, but I actually, um, there's all kinds of ways that students can get involved in schools. I think um, really it's advocating for themselves in terms of what they want to eat. I think um, when, st when students organize, I think the administration tends to listen to them. So I, if that's what the question is, I think that, that that's like a really good direction to go. And for culinary students, I think, Bill, you will have a lot to say about that if that's what this refers to. And I think it's great to actually answer it from both lenses because, yeah, is there a way for like, you know, if it's a school that's K through 12, 12th graders to do something in the kitchen and yes, from external. So that'd be great to hear both. Yeah. And I would just add just one quick thing. Sorry, Bill. Um, you know, by the time kids are in 12th grade, there's like 10 percent of kids eat, eat prepared meals in cafeterias. So for people who are new to kind of the school lunch conversation, I think it's really important to know that. Um, that utilization of lunch, um, you know, it, it starts maybe at 70 or 80 percent and it goes way down. And we could serve much better food um, in schools if everybody bought school lunch. Yes. And, uh, and I think um, and I think that's why it's important to start at an early age to um, to teach these kids about healthy eating. And, you know, once they get into right away and that's why offering really good, fresh, healthy meals in uh, kindergarten, starting in kindergarten and then in grammar school when, so the kids, as they go forward, they're exposed to this. Um, but to your question, I think partly uh, for students, um, I think it becomes, you know, as you get older, you become the, you know, the big shot of the uh, grammar school when you're in fifth grade or so. So having them sort of help you when, if chefs go in and demo and have them sort of uh, help out there, I think uh, working, helping out in the cafeteria with younger children and, and, and um, you know, uh, having them sort of, um, you know, you know, encouraging others to eat well or, you know, uh, helping serve and, and, and maybe at a salad bar or something, which which has been done with in some of our schools. And I think for culinary students, I think 
you know, one of the things that was, you know, would be amazing is that, you know, it's, it's to look at it as a way of life too, working in a, in a school cafeteria, um, you know, where, you know, if you think about, you know, when you go work in restaurants, uh, you know, the benefits aren't that great. The hours suck, um, you know, but, you know, you could get a day job with some benefits if you go work in, in, a, in a school cafeteria and also bring, you know, your skills to it, which I think, you know, um, there are, what's amazing is what I've discovered in the past in the very early stages of wellness in the schools is that a lot of these people had cooked so so much in these schools and a lot of it was taken away as time on, went on to reduce costs. And I think, you know, when you go back to uh, how chefs can advocate for, you know, better lunches, part of it is is dollars. And I think that's where the CNNR, CNR is important. Um, you know, if we could get, you know, more funding into schools, then we could, we could get better, you know, we could train people better, then we could get better food, we could serve local food, which will serve the, the communities better. There's so much um, that, and, you know, culinary students and getting, a, a, you know, a, a rally for better school in, within schools is, would be a, a, a good way to start. So. Absolutely. So in our last three minutes together, there is one very compelling question that I want to ask. Uh, so for the educational component, um, are any of you connecting food with agriculture and things like climate change or plant-based menus? I can tackle that. So we, um, you know, at our research center have also written several curricula and um, including in defense of food, which is one that PBS shares. Um, we, a lot of that, we, we know that there are many different ways to motivate people to eat healthfully. And for some kids, it's the taste, right? Um, for other kids, it's climate change. And so um, talking about how food is grown, where it's grown, how it works can be a real hook for a lot of kids. Um, and so that's something that we encourage to we have many members in our coalition actually who um, focus on growing food. So whether that's school gardens or hydroponic labs, um, that that tends to really resonate, especially with the older kids. Who Andrea mentioned, like um, you know, there's a drop off in school participation, in school meal participation, um, and also often sort of a drop off in attention in programming, right? And um, that's one area where we've seen like great activism and um, a push actually from students to change what's on the menu in their own schools. So I think agriculture and climate change are really important to discuss in addition to sort of talking about cooking, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I find the same thing in my practice, interacting with people who are looking just at regular nutrition, medical nutrition therapy. Um, so right before we end, I do wanna, you know, open up and just ask any of the panelists if there's anything that they are interested in sharing before we close. Well, I wanted well, to I share wanted to quickly, Oh, go ahead, sorry. You go. I wanted to share share the Pilot Lights website. It's pilotlightschefs.org. Um, that's the website. And um, just to piggyback on like climate change and, and kind of bringing sh kids to the farms, I think Pilot does a good job, you know, even before pre-pandemic, taking the kids to farms and 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 introducing them to ingredients. And some stu some schools are doing that in Chicago as well, where they're taking the kids to the actual ingredients, so they actually know where it comes from, how it's grown, connect them with the farmer, and then they feel more connected with the food. Um, so that's a big part of what Pilot does as well. Um, and they do, I hope, you know, hope to do some more trips with like that in the future. But I think they. They really focus on really educating the student and using the teacher and the chef and the professionals to really bring that bring that home and really diversify the the, the love for food because um, once kids kind of understand you know where it comes from how it's grown um, and the taste and how once it, when they taste the freshness of something it's a big difference when you're going into the grocery store and picking it up off the shelf so um, that connection with the farmer is a big part of the agriculture and and climate change has a lot to do with that, how we feed our soil, how we feed you know, the waterways and how we make sure pollution is not a big issue and how we invest in those things and really bring that to, I mean, to the classroom as well as an educational piece. Um, so there's just so many different things that we could you know, branch off food education and, and the academics that are, that are in school um, with feeding students. So. 
Well, I think that that's the perfect way to round out this panel and leave us all with thoughts of thinking how to diversify the love of food. Very well said. I'll take it and I'll run with it. Julia, Andrea, Bill, James, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the James Beard Foundation for hosting this panel. And for those of you out there, thank you for joining us. The recording will be available within two weeks, I believe. Uh, so the recording for this panel will be available. Just go to the James Beard Foundation um, and you'll be able to find the recording there. Wishing you all a wonderful day and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.